was a moment in my life where all I needed was for him to shine his light on me. I met Adam in the spring playing beach volleyball, which was the exact kind of adorable love story that I dreamt of telling our grandkids someday. He was tall, he was redheaded, and he barely had to move to get the ball over the net. I was hungover, frowny, and so bad at volleyball that my teammates visibly cringed when I would show up for the game. Regardless, Adam and I had exchanged numbers by the end of the day. I walked away from it with no expectation of hearing from him since it seemed like he had been paying more attention to my friends anyway. But oddly enough, he did reach out, which should have been the first hint that Adam was the perfect kind of anomaly. The first time we met up outside of the volleyball court, he suggested Taco Tuesday. He was running two hours late, which was clocking us in at a 9 p.m. dinner. Ordinarily, I would have been livid and hangry, but he made up for it by buying us the most expensive shots of whiskey that Waterfront had to offer, <laughs> and then taking us to karaoke. By the end of the night, he had convinced me to break into a parking garage in Little Italy. I couldn't understand why until a plane flew over us so low that I swore we were about to get taken out by it. And just like that, he was my favorite dream and my biggest adventure. By summer, we began dating. Dating is a subjective term, since he would never have called it that. Hanging out was more along the lines of how he would have defined us, always somehow avoiding any conversation really regarding our relationship. This dating was also completely covert, which was something we both agreed on without discussion. At this point, I wasn't sure how our mutual friends would react, so I was on board with being secretive about it for the time being. Part of me assumed that his reasoning was the same, although a deeply buried part of me wondered if there was more to why he was so eager to keep everything hidden. But I leaned into it, and it was horrible, heartbreaking magic. He came in like a force of nature, and before I realized what was happening, I wanted anything and everything to do with him. He was in law school. He had a ridiculous red beard. He had a motorcycle. He bought all my drinks. He barely touched me, but when he did, it carried the electricity of a static shock. And most importantly, he was broken and he needed fixing. <laughs> his childhood had been devastating, and what he considered to be his family was his pet dog, Crash. Though this dog was adorable, Crash was an emperor of emotional maladies. <laughs> Crash was sensitive and anxious and set off by many things that I wouldn't think twice about. Crowds, fire engines, planes, any dog anywhere. In these moments where he'd be thrashing on his leash at whatever object he wanted to destroy, I couldn't help but love the way that Adam fawned over him with the tenderness of both a father and an older dickheaded brother <laughs> as he both shushed the dog and also shoved him sternly away. Once that summer, we were running late for a birthday dinner as we always were. I'll take Crash out, I offered, as a way to calm my anxiety for being the latest ones there. I hated being late and Adam was always the last to arrive for any occasion. As Crash and I turned the corner to get back to his apartment, I learned about the object he feared and loathed the most, the skateboard. As three young hooligans skated towards us, he completely lost his shit. In a blind rage, he turned towards me, gnashing his teeth, and before I could even react, he bit down on the front of my dress and pulled, ripping it from the collar all the way down. I suddenly found myself literally disrobed and shell-shocked in front of these teens who quickly skated away in discomfort. <laughs> I held my dress together as best I could and entered the building. As the elevator dinged at his floor, the doors opened to reveal him and he barely glanced at me as I sputtered, crash ripped my dress off. <laughs> With no affect whatsoever, he said, yeah, he doesn't like skateboards. <laughs> he walked us back to his apartment handed me a needle and thread, and he waited for me to sew my dress back together. <laughs> His reaction felt wrong to me, and yet I couldn't explain to myself exactly why. I had always been the kind of girl who knew how to speak her mind, 
and I could feel the words piling up on my tongue, but being an, unable to force their way out of my mouth. What I wanted to say was, what the actual fuck? It's a miracle your dog didn't rip my intestines out. Now you want me to sew my clothes back onto my body and act like that didn't happen? But I didn't say that. I took the needle and thread and I got to work. As I made the last stitch, I set into place the reality of a power imbalance that began to fester like an infection. This is also when I found a place where I could create rules that I knew no one other than myself could control, my body. No carbs, I declared. And from there on out, I banned all bread and pasta from the pantry. Adam and I continued to date secretly. When our mutual friends began to notice how much time we spent together, I would say, we're just really good friends. And I'll be honest, I got off on the secretiveness. I felt like I lived in duality, acting like nothing was going on and then slipping away from everyone to engage in reckless adventures. I'm the kind of girl who goes to bed at 8.30 on Sundays, and all of a sudden, I found myself sneaking away to Vegas with Adam for 24 hours so that we could stay awake until 6 a.m., drinking beers and eating diner food at a greasy spoon off the strip. Every plan he suggested was the best plan I had ever heard of, and every joke he made was the best that had ever been told. Sometimes I wouldn't hear from him for, for an entire day or more, but I knew better than to be the one to reach out. Deep inside of my body, there was a tiny seed of knowledge that the more I made myself available, the more he would want to discard me. I decided to stop eating sugar. I would look in the mirror in the mornings and try to pinpoint what exactly wasn't good enough for him. What was it in the fabric of my being that was somehow fundamentally not quite right? I knew something was wrong with me, I just didn't know what. On Saturday mornings, I would avoid the errands I knew I needed to run and laze around his apartment, oftentimes sitting with Crash, as we both waited patiently for Adam to decide it was time for us all to start our day. I eventually forced him to agree to being in a relationship with me, a conversation that felt very similar to a nurse holding down a screaming child as they come at them with a needle. <laughs> he would find any way of avoiding any discussion of what we were. But he met my parents after getting high in the car. He was basically always high, though at the time I didn't understand that this was his coping mechanism for simply making it through any given day. He also came to my family Thanksgiving, which we ended up being two hours late for. See, they all waited for us. It's fine, he whispered as we all sat down to the feast upon our arrival. In that moment, I wondered what reality it was that he existed in but I had fallen in love with him, so it didn't really matter, though the truth of it all itched at me like a little finger scratching inside my stomach. It's like when you get a small chip in your windshield and you avoid dealing with it, and then one day you wake up and you've realized it's stretched into a massive damaging crack. Where did I really lose myself? At what point did I let it become this way? The crack grew bigger and things began to feel even more strained. He'd ignore my call for hours and then call back acting like nothing had happened. I, in turn, would avoid breakfast and wait for lunch to come around. I'd go on long runs and I'd feel searing pain in my stomach and think, yes, yes, yes. Every time he disappeared for a day and then came back, he'd give me the look of a kicked puppy and I would know that he knew he was in trouble. So I'd forgive him, and we'd take his car on a joyride and let the wind mess up our hair, and as he smoked his weed pen, we'd be Bonnie and Clyde again. One day, a few friends brought up their concern. It was brunch, and I was avoiding my toast. Adam was fine. They were fine with him. It wasn't about Adam, but oh, how it was. We're worried about you, they murmured. You barely eat anymore. And as they hugged me, I could feel them wrapping their arms around me and lingering on my rib cage. You're being ridiculous, I said, laughing it off. At home that night, I lay on my back and ran my fingers over each protruding rib, touching each one with the delicacy of a piano key. What a beautiful gift they had given me in those words, I thought to myself. 
If only they knew how much I had needed to hear that my efforts were paying off. New rule, one hard boiled egg for breakfast, half of a salad for lunch, roasted veggies for dinner. The hardest part was falling asleep. Later, a friend offhandedly described how if you don't eat enough, your blood sugar drops in the night, which causes you to wake up and not be able to fall asleep again. I didn't make any comment or remark, but inside of me, I held a secret moment of realization. This explained to me why I would wake up most nights around 3 a.m. and just lie there until I finally would wake and go running in the pitch black for five miles. On the night that this didn't happen, I dreamt desperately of food. One sticky summer night, Adam went to a wedding that I wasn't invited to. I had met these friends of his, and the fact that I wasn't invited made the itch come back. He asked me to stay with Crash until he came home that night, and I obliged. Crash and I spent the late afternoon keeping ourselves busy at all our usual haunts, finding whatever it took to avoid opening the fridge. I hadn't heard from Adam that night, and a pinging bloomed in my heart. I quieted it by looking in the mirror and finding control in the one place it still existed, my body. But as I looked in the mirror, nothing and no one looked back at me. I could no longer see myself, and nothing reflected even mattered anymore. Nothing could have been good enough, and nothing could have made me feel connected to myself. I didn't exist anymore. I was no one. As the hours passed, Crash and I waited. I sat with him on the floor of Adam's immaculate apartment, so flawless and well-maintained like every other thing in his life. This perfection had drawn me to him, and in this moment, he was a man and I was a helpless girl. Petting Crash's silky fur, we caught each other's eyes, and I saw the depth of my own sadness reflected in his. Adam was our son, and we were both marred by devotion and love just waiting for him to shine his warmth on us for even a glorious moment. Crash couldn't choose his life. He was truly trapped. But I also knew that that dog would never abandon his owner, even if he could. I knew I was the same. I fell asleep that night knowing he would not return, and I was right. I awoke with an immediate feeling of panic in an empty bed. It felt torturous to stay at his apartment, but I couldn't seem to make myself go. Crash and I sat on his plush leather couches and stared out the window waiting. He came through the door that afternoon already spinning stories that I knew I would eventually believe as though I had come up with them myself. He apologized. He touched me. My lizard brain knew in this moment that he used this as a dangerous tool of manipulation but I honestly didn't care. I was too far gone. We fell asleep that night, intertwined, and before I closed my eyes, he stroked my hair and kissed me with a tenderness that I knew had never been innate for him. But in this moment, I could feel that his tenderness was pure, not contrived. I closed my eyes, knowing that we were finally turning a corner while he closed his eyes, knowing that he had just said goodbye. He abruptly broke up with me within 48 hours as an Uber I had ordered was pulling up. It took months for me to move beyond him ending it with me, and months for me to truly taste food without a stab of guilt and anger at myself. I still couldn't find myself in a reflection, and I still puzzled over what part of me was wrong. But one day I woke up and I decided to try eating toast for breakfast. And another day, I let myself resign to an ice cream cone. I had somehow escaped, though he had never been my prison guard. I had been my own. But through all of this, I ultimately was able to find peace in finding my own sense of adventure, my own ability to seek the unknown, but most importantly, in acquiring the knowledge that I can never not be my own son 
and that every human being must shine on themselves before they can ever truly shine on another. Thank you. That was Kate Cole, everybody. Give it up.